Rich Newberg reports. Tonight, a life in the balance. Should we be doing more to help the mentally ill cope in society? And my mother's dead. Nothing can bring her back. Judy Scanlon, an intensive case manager, paid a home visit to an outpatient and never came out. The patient, Diane Wiley, stands accused of beating her to death with a blunt object. There's something very, very wrong with this system that allows things like this to happen. I was trying to get them voices out of his head. I know my child. A jury found Anthony Bester criminally responsible for the death of his father. He was shot twice and stabbed more than 55 times. But should an outpatient with Bester's history have been required by law to take his antipsychotic medication? There's got to be a program in place that requires him to report, requires him to take the drugs that uh, keep him from becoming violent. This is everyone's tragedy because everybody has a Kendra in their life. Kendra Webdale's life ended on subway tracks in Manhattan. Police say Andrew Goldstein, an outpatient being treated for schizophrenia, pushed her in front of an oncoming train. It is believed he had not taken his medication. These stories made frightening headlines and may have further stigmatized the mentally ill. I think the average person fears people with mental illness. They are indifferent to those that they don't fear, uh, that they want somebody to take care of them, but they, don't, they want their tax dollars to go back into their pockets. One of every five of us will have some connection with mental illness, either personal or someone close to us. There is a system that was created to deal with the various levels of this illness, but more and more it seems that people are falling through the cracks, sometimes with tragic consequences. We're about to take you deep inside those cracks, into a world unfamiliar to most of us. Take a good hard look, then you decide if more needs to be done to save a life in the balance. <laughs> John Hack has been diagnosed with schizophrenia. In what now seems as another lifetime, John had set the pace for his track team at Tonawanda High School, setting new records for indoor and outdoor competition. He could run, he, he could run like a deer. He was unbelievably smart, uh, uh, strong, uh, in fantastic physical condition. Uh, Really, uh, did a lot of weightlifting then. But something was beginning to change inside this young achiever's head. Towards the end of his high school years, that we began to notice that he wasn't able to sit and read anymore and to, to continue uh, concentration. He wasn't able to, to focus in on things and, and stay focused. He turned down college invitations and joined the Army becoming a squad leader during basic training. But by then, voices inside his head were beginning to put him down. Every time I ever became ill at that point, I couldn't identify that I was being bizarre or inconsistent. About a year after he was discharged from the Army, John Hack calmly walked into this M&T bank on Broad Street in Tonawanda. He had a paper bag with him, and he waited patiently in line for the teller. Well, I had waited my turn, actually. I walked to the teller, and then at this point, I asked her, you know, that she would fill the bag, be so kind and fill this bag with the money in the register. Did she? Yes, she did. She seemed uh, at a loss for words at that point. And he said that uh, there were agents, voices in his head that told him he should go in and pick up this money. John suddenly found himself behind bars in the Erie County Holding Center. Bizarre behavior would finally lead to a diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia, but years of torment would follow in and out of jails and institutions. And they're cut off from everyone. Their old friends desert them and, and because they're, they're bizarre and they're no longer understood, and, and so they lose friendships and they depend on their families for their socialization. But even with his family's support, 
John's tormented life became even more complicated when he began abusing cocaine. He hit rock bottom when police found him in a semi-comatose state on the street. That's when the Alliance for the Mentally Ill began making demands on the system in his behalf. For the first time in almost 20 years, he's getting the services he needs. But it took a hell of a fight. Now it's up to John to make a life for himself. His apartment is subsidized, and his medical and social needs are being met in what's called wraparound care. He's getting the full shot from the mental health system. What's success for John maybe isn't what we had hoped and dreamed for. But right now, we consider John successful at this today. Success is measured day by day, sometimes hour by hour. The antipsychotic drugs John takes suppress the voices in his head, allow him to focus, and keep him calm in stressful situations, like being told by a store clerk that the clerk was unable to change a battery in John's type of watch. Is there any particular reason why one watch can't be done um, as another one can? You Casios. don't sell any Casios? Just Casios are more complicated or something. That's why we can't do it. All right. Thanks. He wants to join mainstream life, just like just like you or I. You know, he, he wants to. He wants everything that I want. You know, he wants a job, he wants the uh, family, maybe his own family, his own wife, maybe his own, uh, well, he's got a place to live, but maybe his own house. Uh, that's what he wants. I thought I'd be at the age of 35, 15 years ago, that I, would, that I would come to a point where I would have been married and had children and a house and a good job until, it's, until I was struck with this illness. But through it all, John's family has been there for him because some things just remain the same. How you love them never changes, no matter what, you know, um, never changes. And, and I see in John when, when he's well and, and doing well, um, I see a kindness in John and and his brightness, his intellect, his um, wanting to be joyful in life is there. His faith, he has a faith, strong faith. In a tiny corner of the world, on Buffalo's Lower West Side, life has a certain routine for many who have spent part of their lives in institutions. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay. There's Karam's Corner Deli, where prices are reasonable and the owner is understanding. And there's a landlady named Bertha, whose life mission, she says, is to help the homeless and the mentally ill find shelter. I'll pick anybody up the street and help them out. Her tenants are everywhere in this small circle of society inhabited by society's most vulnerable population. This is Bertha's world. This, from Johnson Park over to Niagara, to Carolina, to Georgia, this is the safest place for these people to be because everybody around here understands them and knows them. If you put them any place out that way, they're going to, you know, they're going the vultures are going to get them. We're going right here and this one here. Robbie Anderson manages one of Bertha's rooming houses. He led me to the room of James Archer, a troubled tenant who was victimized by the vultures in another part of the city. I heard physically and emotionally. After being beaten with a steel bar and stabbed, he relocated here, deeply depressed, with little more than the clothes on his back. Uh, he had no TV, no radio. Now he's got something to watch, and I feed him, too. While it can be a rather stark living environment, many of Bertha's tenants are trying to make the best of it. This tiny room is home for a husband and wife, giving life a try outside of the Buffalo Psychiatric Center. Like but that. the husband had a violent episode, and his okay. wife told me he has to be hospitalized for three months. Well, he was off medication for a while. That's why he's back in. Another tenant, Marcia, says she fought to get out of the psychiatric center and is now taking her medication. 
she's still in touch with her family and appears to be doing well. Bertha has taken her in before when she went off her medication and got kicked out of other apartments. That's when the voices made her life unbearable. It's like whispers coming in my ears, and then I hear buzzing sounds, like a, like you're listening to a seashell. It sounds like that when it starts. And what is the whispering? What 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 is it saying? About people I know, they're talking bad about me, and you know, it's, it seems like they're putting me down. And these are voices of people you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you talk back? Yeah, sometimes I do. But sometimes I can't handle it and when I'm off my medication and I just try and commit suicide. Okay, you smoke that outside now. Deli owner Nick Karam knows 99% of his customers. He knows how some lives hang on a delicate balance of medication and circumstance. But they often tell him they would rather exist in Bertha's world than be locked away in an institution. What they feel is better than being on the inside at least out here, they have a little freedom. They can get up and walk around. They can visit with other friends. They can go from one house to another house. They can go to a movie. They can do what they want to do. And they often help each other get through life. I'm washing up another guy's clothes, too. It's nice to be needed. One hand washes the other in Bertha's world. Over the years, we've seen some changes in the law that allow many mental patients the right to live in the least restrictive environment. Our state hospitals have been significantly downsized, shifting the burden of care to local communities. But there's a price to be paid, and some are wondering if counties and cities are properly equipped to handle the needs of the more severe cases. In four decades, the patient population at the Buffalo Psychiatric Center has gone from 3,700 to about 250. Now the Erie County Medical Center and Buffalo General are among the hospitals serving the outpatients who cannot cope. So the notion is moving from we just lock patients away custodially into a state hospital, rather we give them community resources and brief psychiatric hospitalization at local hospitals for periods of time where they might need hospitalization to help them cope on the outside there are social clubs and drop-in centers stressing social skills and individual responsibility and state intensive case managers like bill lamagna who are contracted by Erie County to go into the homes of those considered most at risk. And there's some fellows that are regardless what you do, they'll never take their medications, you can't push the point, you can't adequately monitor that situation, so you wait till they get to a point where they could be um, readmitted to the hospital. Judy Scanlon was a dedicated intensive case manager who was aware of the risks and often talked about them with her family. Her express wishes was that everybody knows and is aware that the system has flaws and that there needs to be some type of reassessment to help take care of everybody else. And my mother's dead. Nothing can bring her back. Judy Scanlon was beaten to death in the home of one of her patients. Diane Wiley, a mother who may have feared losing custody of her daughter, was charged with the murder. Ironically, Judy, a mother of three children, was said to be fighting in Diane Wiley's behalf so she could keep her daughter. But in this particular case, there were no warning signs. And, you know, as a result, you know, there needs to be a lot of concern as to why there wasn't. Diane Wiley had a history of violence, acquitted of robberies because of mental impairment. There's also some question whether she had taken her medication. Judy's death led to candlelight vigils by mental health workers in Buffalo and across the state calling for safeguards. We have situations now where we are dangerously understaffed and as a result of that, people like Judy Scanlon have to make decisions about their jobs every day that involve their own health and safety. 
To ensure safety, the union is calling for two workers for house visits, two-way radios for emergencies, and more sharing of patient background information from other agencies. But is the system ready to immediately answer the call? It's going to cost a lot more money to have two counselors available. Does that mean then that there'll be less clients visited? And does that also mean that there may be a population of people who won't get served as well? So that's a question that has to be addressed. But mental health workers say the second person doesn't have to be a counselor, just someone there for security. Judy Scanlon's family says a majority of her cases involve patients with violent tendencies. Probably half those individuals should be institutionalized. And why they are being allowed in the community is a question that everybody is asking and is something that's up to the system to reassess. Anthony Bester's family wanted his condition reassessed. His mental problems had caused them heartaches for years. He will have voices. He has come to me and said, what? He was like, Mom, what I'm hearing? I hear somebody talking to me. I hear somebody talking to me. I, and when we was by ourselves, I would sit up with him night after night. Then sometimes he would get violent from the voices, the voices tell him to do something. He never touched me or nothing, but he would walk around the house throwing things. And, you know, he just got violent and shaky and walking back and forth. The night before Easter Sunday, 1997, Anthony's father, Jesse, took him to Buffalo General Hospital because he was acting violent. He hadn't taken his medication in three months, but Anthony didn't want to stay and left the hospital without treatment. The police, too, had already left. The police folks stayed there with him till he got that shot and calmed down, because if he so psychotic, he could have killed anybody in the hospital. That's why they supposed to stay there. They left. Eight carloads of police was at my mother's house. They left. On Easter Sunday, he shot his father twice and stabbed him more than 55 times. A jury rejected Bester's plea of insanity, holding him responsible for making bad decisions. But his attorney said the system failed because there weren't safeguards to make sure that Anthony Bester took his medication for paranoia. Part of the illness is that he thinks something in the medicine is hurting him. So you can't rely on a system that doesn't have enough checks and balances to make sure that the people that need the treatment are actually participating in the treatment. Andrew Goldstein may not have been participating in his treatment. He may have been off his medication for schizophrenia when police say he pushed Fredonia native Kendra Webdale in front of an oncoming subway train in Manhattan. Uh, we want to remember her as a, uh, as a uh, kind, sweet, happy individual and who loved life, and uh, we're going to miss her an awful lot. Kendra's murder and other recent tragedies have led New York's Attorney General Elliot Spitzer to propose a law that would require outpatients with more serious disorders to take their medication or be involuntarily committed for emergency evaluation. A statute like this has a tremendous impact both in terms of increased care, the patients do better, there are fewer inpatient uh, days needed because patients subject to these orders actually continue on their medication. While it's designed to protect society, it also raises questions about a patient's rights. Keep a shorter leash, if you will, on his freedom. Now that rankles uh, some people who uh, believe that we have no right whatsoever to infringe upon uh, the rights of any civilian, uh, whether they're mentally ill or not. But the fact is society always has had the right to protect itself uh, from the deeds of others by legislation and by uh, developing programs that will help society live peacefully. There are programs that have been developed to help outpatients live peacefully, reinforcing the notion that they have a right to plan a future for themselves. And the man who oversees the State Association for many of these psychiatric rehabilitation services believes in most cases a patient should not be forced to do anything, including taking medication or going to the hospital for treatment. I think in general people should have choice about treatment. It, I, I may make a choice that I don't want to receive treatment for a condition I have, um, and that may be a bad choice for me, but it still should remain my choice. Um, 
unless I become dangerous to myself or others. That's a standard in New York State now for involuntarily hospitalizing someone. Are they dangerous to themselves or others? Are they going to hurt somebody? Oh, yes, I'm a paranoid schizophrenic. And I'm also an outpatient at the VA hospital. Mr. Gustaferro knows there are critical needs in addition to medication that can tip the scale when a life is in the balance. I have a desperate need of some food as well. When was the last time you had a square meal? 10 o'clock this morning, and I have nothing to eat at night at all. And I go to Mr. Cram's store, and he feeds me a meal 10 in the morning, right? And then after that, I don't go through the next morning. I have nothing. Well, we offer, we do serve lunch, and on the days we're open, we serve dinner. Okay. Uh, we have some socializing programs. Uh, we have some rehabilitation programs. If you want to make some changes in your life, we could help you to make plans for that. Jack Gustaferro's Restoration Society, along with his drop-in centers and employment program, serve eight to 900 outpatients a year. But he hasn't seen a budget increase in two years and is now operating $20,000 in the red. The safety net is only as strong as the threads that tie it together. You have to meet all the needs. If you meet only part of them, it falls apart. It doesn't stand. It's like, it's like pick up sticks. You can take away piece by piece. And nothing, it looks like nothing happens, Rich. And then you pull out one last piece and the whole thing crashes. Though she may be dwarfed by the size of the imposing Richardson building that once held her as a patient, Kathy Lynch can now look back on that stage of her life with some distance and perspective. You feel as if you're not part of humanity anymore. Um, you're removed from society. Um, you feel very estranged and isolated from, uh, from people and life in general. Those days of isolation for manic depression are over for her now. These days, she is working with others who have been through the system to improve the quality of life for patients throughout the region. Any kind of creative self-expression, whether it's art or writing or music, I think that's real positive and real healthy for people. Kathy was one of the first to recognize that recovering patients could help each other live a better life. And the first to create quite an uproar in the community because uh, psychiatrists said, well, you can't have uh, really crazy people with serious psychiatric disorders doing self-help with fellow crazy people. This will not work. You have to have this run by professionals. And we were so successful that we had psychiatrists then mandating, forcing people to attend. And we said, that violates our principles of choice. You know, the pure self-help movement is based on choice. Now, at all levels of the system, you will find peer advocates reaching out to patients, offering a variety of self-help opportunities. We got music, yeah, we got, uh, we got mostly anything you would like to do. I can take a walk over there. Cool. From a club member to a CEO of a private housing agency, those who know the system from the inside are now changing the system uh, from the inside. Pretty much. There is nothing more comforting than to have somebody to share your experience with that has been there and come out the other side. And speaking of comfort, the state-run Olmstead residence in Buffalo combines homey living with coping skills for a life on the other side. Our goal is to make sure that they can upgrade their skills and they have a social network in place where they'll have a better quality of life. Group homes like this offer a clean environment and supervised care. When a resident comes through here, he is ready to return to the community. You have your freedom to go where you want to go, when you want to go. There's a curfew, but other than that, it's uh, pretty free. Quite a contrast to the way the mentally ill used to be treated, when many had no hope of ever returning to society, when many with great potential were held captive behind locked doors, and straitjackets were used for lack of drugs that could help clear up the confusion. As a physician, our black bag of instruments and tools is expanding, and um, 
and, I, and my sense is that more people have a sense of hope and recovery uh, from their mental illness than, than ever before. But are the resources there to accommodate patients hoping to re-enter the mainstream of society? And are there enough long-term beds to accommodate those who cannot readjust? There's been talk that another 20 beds are about to be eliminated at the Buffalo Psychiatric Center. Why are they closing wards when there's people that need long-term care? What happens is, is that as we get uh, patients refer, referred through the criminal court system, which is our primary referral source now, so basically, you walk around the hospital and say, hey, uh, Rich, you're in pretty good shape. It's your turn to go. And we place you on the community. But as the system becomes overtaxed, the governor has proposed only a 2% budget increase for counties. We're in a conservative mode today. I mean, everybody wants to cut taxes. Everybody wants to consolidate. Nobody wants to engage in any new programs. The days of the great society died with LBJ. Unmet needs of those most at risk seem to be posing increasing dangers now for some outpatients and the greater society at large. They're in jail, they're in prisons, they're in homeless shelters, they're in cesspool boarding houses. Half of them are living with their families who have no training, who have no resources, who have no vacations. Uh, and very little help in providing what they need. As the mental health system struggles to meet the needs of a growing population of outpatients, the patients, in many cases, are realizing that ultimately they hold the key to their own recovery. They've been empowered to give life a try outside the walls of institutions. And though a series of tragic episodes has given us all a chill, the majority are asking us to keep an open mind and an open heart. For the fact is, one out of five of us will somehow be touched by mental illness. I'm Rich Newberg. Good night. I'll give you some tobacco and some rolling papers. I can't. I'll roll for you. I'll roll for you. You'd be good then. Why society is like that? I don't know. I, I, I always thought we were all God's children. I don't have any food. No money in my pocket, no nothing. And I, I just would like to thank my family for being there for me. Immediately stop the cutbacks in mental health. Oh, stop the cutbacks. Uh, for everyone that's getting what they need in the community, there are probably 20 that aren't. 